But my dad sent me like this two paragraph thing to introduce the children to our career. I'm going to tell you what we want to do. <laughs> um, well, I think for children, it's really important that they have a foundation in Christ, that they don't just hear about Christ, that they truly understand who he is. Because growing up, it's difficult in schools and sometimes at home too. And if you teach children at a younger age, it's easier for them to understand when things start happening at home. And to me, children are truly really like, quite right? obviously, they're the next generation of this world. We're not, well, I'm not pretty much in the same category as those. When my parents aren't here and my grandparents aren't here, then I will be.
why we ask you to do this every week, and it's not so we can bother you or send you a dozen emails a week. Okay, so it's basically we like to have your information organized that way we're not bombarding you with a million mass messages and text messages and emails and such that
out in the community, and we see there's so many people that aren't finding and they aren't following Jesus. And even though we have a lot of churches in this area, there's still a lot of people that those churches aren't reaching. And what we found out and what we know is you can't have a relationship with somebody until you start to know them. And you can't have what, and it doesn't matter whether it's a relationship with Jesus or a relationship with a, with a friend. You can't have what they offer you until you get to know them. And we know Jesus, whether you believe in him or not, our desire is to, to draw you closer because we know what he has to offer you. This love that's, that's so unconditional. This hope that we can have in something so much bigger than us. But you can't know that until you're introduced to him. So our job as a church is to introduce you to a man named Jesus Christ, who we believe is the living God. And our studies have shown, at least to the, the last uh, census uh, done in the United States, that, that two out of every three people in Sussex County don't know who Jesus is. They don't have a relationship with him. So it's important to us that we reach out to that untapped market, if you will. And the scripture we used last week is it, what most Bibles call the Great Commission. It, it sort of came around that name around 300. A.D., it began calling it, but the, the, what we call the Great Commission found in, in Matthew chapter 28 is also found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and it's found in the book of Acts. So, so it's obviously very important to the writers and to God that, that we go out. And what we found out is, is Jesus gives us this great command, this command to go out and make disciples. But with that, he gives us a great authority. He gives us his power and his authority to go forward. But with that great command and with that great power, he also gives us a great promise. He says, I'm not going to leave you on your own. I'm going to go out with you. I'll be right there to help you along the way. Now, some people believe that, that what we call the Great Commission, these verses found in Matthew uh, 28, is, uh, is, is actually the last words of Jesus. That after he spoke these words, that he blessed the crowd and he went back to his heavenly throne. There's, there's this old legend. This is not a story. It's a legend. It, it, it may be a, a fabricated story, but there's an old legend that says that after Jesus arrived back in heaven, of course there was all kinds of excitement. The, the angels were there to welcome him. But after the, the excitement sort of died down, the angel Gabriel comes up to Jesus and says, You know, Jesus, you suffered so much mankind. You took on the burdens of all their sins. You were willing to die for this. Everybody in the world, does everybody down there on earth know that? And Jesus says, oh no. There's only a couple people in Jerusalem, maybe a few people in Galilee, and that's it. Gabriel says, well, what's your plan? How are you going to let everybody know of your great love for them? He goes, oh, I, 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 I told all the apostles to go out and spread the word to the farthest corners of the world, that they would tell people, and those people would Gabriel's face grows a little dimmer and he looks down and says, But Jesus, what if Peter? What if Peter just decides to go back to the fish? What if John and Andrew and James all decide to do the same thing? What if Matthew just says, You know, this is too hard. I made so much money as a tax collector. What if, what if he goes back to the tax collector? What if the other ones lose their passion, they lose their zeal, and they just stop and quit telling them? After a few seconds, Jesus just screams. Why we do what we do? Because this is God's plan to tell people about His love. This is God's plan so that we can go out and tell people about His love. And so that those people can go out. And we're to do that until He returns again. So that's really the why behind why we do what we do. Today we want to talk about the what. And, and last week we gave out an invitation for those of, those, those of you that wanted to, to help us out. I'm so thankful for those of you that filled out those forms. I really am. And, and people help out in different ways. We have people uh, volunteering to come up and help us sing. We, we really need it. Uh, Jimmy, you did a wonderful job today. And, and we had this one lady who, who ministers in a way that shows her love in a way that I love. She brings us food. Uh, like some of the best chicken wings I ever had. I think I gained it another five pounds if she keeps on. I'm going to just have a big blimp up here talking. But, but you know, we all minister and show the love of Jesus a different way. 
But again, if you missed the message last week, you want to see what's behind, you'll be able to check it out later this week. So we talked about the, the why. Today we want to talk about the, the what. And, and the, the what is found, the scripture that I want to talk to you about this morning is found in Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15, we're going to look at verses 1 through 21. That's Acts chapter 15. So if you have your Bibles or if you have an iPad or you have a cellular device or something, you have a Bible app on turn there now. And if you don't, it's okay because we're going to put the, the verses right up here on the screen. And I'm going to be reading today from the New Living Translation. I like the New Living Translation because it's just so simple. Like it makes a person like me be able to understand it. But here's something I've observed over the years. I've been in church for really most of my life. I drifted away for a while. But for the last 18, 19 years, we've been pretty regular right church attenders. And there's an observation. And the observation is most churches are designed for church people, right? Most churches are designed for church people. They play the songs that church people like. They have an order of service that either that denomination or that local church expects to have. They have the pictures on the wall that most church people would be comfortable with. And I want you to know there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that at all. In fact, I've served in and I've attended many, many churches that were built by and built for church people. And there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. But, here's what I knew. When I wanted to invite an unchurched friend to church, I wasn't going to invite him to that church that I was attending. Because I knew that unchurched friend of mine would not be comfortable in that church. That they wouldn't understand the ceremony. They may not like the music that was playing. So when I brought an unfriend church, I took them to a different church. But my real first experience that I had was this. So we were, we, Dan and I had gone around and looked for different churches. We fell and fell in love with the church. And we were there for over 10 years, maybe close to 15 years. But it was a big church. It had over 1,000 people. We started about 600. By the time we left, there was over 1,000 people coming on Sunday mornings. They had a large children ministry with Dan and my sister uh, were able to run. They had over 100 kids there. Sunday mornings, they bust half of them in. Uh, half of them were brought by the members of the congregation. Uh, they had team ministry that was amazing. Uh, on Friday nights, they had somewhere between 300 and sometimes over 500 teenagers come out to a youth group. It was exciting. It was a big church with a, a big vision. They were doing big things. Uh, you could choose from seven, eight, nine different uh, Bible studies, schools in the morning. So if you wanted a, a Bible study that was on relationships, you had that. If you wanted one on finances, you had that. If you wanted to go deeper into the Word, you had that. All kinds of different Bible studies. They had all kinds of outreach ministries, so no matter what you like to do, they had something for you to help other people. Again, a big church with a big vision, doing a lot of big things. And one day, I met with a friend of mine who's now a pastor as well, and he had brought a pastor friend with him, and the conversation, I think it was sad, because the conversation sort of drifted into, hey, Bobby, you want to pour out some of the things that Pour those out into others. And before the end of the meeting, I was offered a position in a small church that was the disguise of pastor. So we left this, this big church of over a thousand people when we went to this smaller church of about 25. And in this church, I, in this denomination, I was what's called a lay speaker. And, and what that meant was I got to occasionally speak the message, which I love. I got to do the Bible studies, which I love. Uh, but you didn't have a choice on Bible studies, there was only one. And you had to teach the Bible study that the book told you you had to teach. And that was it. I got a seat on the board. I got a seat on the committee. I had all this. And it was a ter terrific, terrific experience. In fact, uh, most of those people in that church have become close friends of mine. Uh, my mom still attends the church. In fact, on opening day, uh, we had six or seven of them were here. But it was definitely a church for church people. And when you walk into that church, you knew it was a church for church people. It would look just exactly what you would expect it to look like. But here was the problem. The people that came in weren't church. Most of them didn't come back because they didn't understand the rules. They didn't understand what was going They felt uncomfortable. So when we first started considering opening the Augustine Church, part of our research was we went to a different church every week. We wanted to see what they did right. We wanted to see what we didn't like. And then if we really liked the church, we went back to it again to see if maybe, you know, they just had a good Sunday and it was a fluke. Or, what were they doing right? What set them apart from the churches that we didn't so much care? 
And, and it wasn't that they were all, any of them were bad churches. They were all great churches, but they all had distinctive personalities. And what we began to realize, the more a church focused in, the smaller it was. The more the church became for the people that attended the church, the more the church became for the church people, the less it became for the outside people, the less the unchurched people. We, I, went to, I went by myself, and when I knew the pastor, so I went to a church. I knew it was a small church, a local church, only about 25 people going to it. And when I get in, the pastor knows me, so him and his wife, they're real nice to me. But everybody else doesn't even talk to me. You know, they shake my hand at the door. I sit down, and the guy comes up on the stage to do the welcome, and he's talking about the people calling everybody by name, and, and, and he's talking about the Christmas party they had, and all the fun they had. And, pastor gets up and says the message and his illustration is about the people that, that are in the church and he's calling by name and here I am sitting there and I'm starting to get a little comfortable and the only way that I can relate it was when I was a, a teenager I would be invited to a family's house for dinner and you know if you've ever been to a family's house for dinner they're all sitting around the dinner and they're laughing and they're joking and they're talking about their family and they're telling the jokes and you feel like such a stranger because you don't know who they're talking about you don't know the backstories of what they're laughing at and you just feel out of place and you feel uncomfortable. And, and that's how I feel in this church. You know, they're, they're all family. And I'm not part of the family, so I'm sort of being ignored. The gravitational pull of every organization, including churches, the gravitational pull is towards insiders. In this church, they were so inwardly focused. They were, they were so inwardly focused. They were pleasing their guests so much that they didn't even pay attention to how uncomfortable their guests were. They were pleasing their members so much. They, they weren't even seeing how uncomfortable their guests were. And I'll just let you know, it wasn't only the churches that we visited twice. The gravitational pull of every church, every organization, is that we begin to look at its members. We begin to look at the church church becomes a church for church people. Now the problem with this is I see it, and not everyone's going to agree with it. I know that, and that's okay. The problem with is with that is whether we intentionally do this or whether we unintentionally do this, and I don't think anybody will do this intentionally, if we start subconsciously presenting this message that Christianity is for church people and it's not for unchurch people, you go into a church that's so inwardly focused that as a guest, you're not even noticed, you start to believe that the church in Christianity itself is for the people who know the rules and the people that look like them. So if we're not intentional and if we're not careful, we'll do the same thing here. And I don't think there's one person in this room, whether you believe in Jesus yet, whether you've been walking with Jesus forever, whether you're just seeking or whether you're a new believer, I don't think there's one person in this world in this room that believes church is just for church people. But the truth is, if we're not careful, we're going to develop programs and we're going to make this church so comfortable for those that are in that we're going to make it very hard for those that are far away from God to find and follow Jesus. Maybe you're like me. I have this conversation more often than probably any other conversation. I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. I believe in the Bible. But I don't go to church. I believe in God. I believe in the Bible. But I don't really want anything to do with church. And I don't want anything to do with church. And when you start asking the story, when you start talking, what you find out is they have had a bad experience in the church. Jesus did not come just for church. Jesus came for everybody. In fact, Jesus even said, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I've come not to call those who think they're righteous. I've come to call those who know they're sinners. So Jesus says, I've come for everybody. But I've especially come for those who are far away from God and know they need something bigger than 
And you probably remember this verse. It may be one of the, the very first verses you ever memorized as a child or you first heard as a child. If you went to Sunday school, probably one of the first certain verses you ever heard as a child. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that those who believe in him shall not perish but have a So who did he come for? The world. The entire world. Not just the church people, not just the insiders, but for every unchurch and the church alike. And yet, without meaning to, I don't think any of us would do this on purpose, without meaning to, we continually build churches for church people and we sort of leave behind the young church people. And if we're not careful, if we're not intentional, we're going to do the same thing here at the Odyssey Church. Because what we found out, the more church you become, the more church the church becomes, the more we sort of gravitate towards our insiders. We start saying, well, you know, so-and-so over here doesn't like the way we do it, and so-and-so over here gets a lot of money, and we don't want to lose it. So we start tailoring to the people inside the church. And what we do is we start meeting the needs of the few, and we quit meeting the needs of the many. Two-thirds of the people in this town. We don't do something about it. We believe this is true. Maybe you don't believe this, but we believe this is true. We'll die and go to a place of eternal torment, a place the Bible describes as hell. So we want to develop the Aussie church. What behind the wall is we want to develop a church where unchurched people are welcome. And we know we have a long way to go. We want to do this by creating environments that are so exciting, so inviting, so comfortable, that even if you don't believe in Jesus yet, even if you're a new believer, that you'll want to come back, you'll love to attend the Odyssey Church. And some of you probably right now are thinking to yourself, did he really just say comfortable by in this cold metal chair that is so uncomfortable? We know we have a long ways to go. Considering the limitations we have of starting a brand new church, with what Taylor talked to you about today, I mean, we're starting a children's program that's not modeled after other children's programs. We're talking about one that's helping kids through the grace of God and through the teachings of Scripture, we're helping deal with everyday life so that when they grow up, they can know how to handle their finances, so they can know how to handle their career, so they can live life better and live it more abundantly. Good news. Good news. We're not the first generation to struggle with this. If you want to follow along with me again, we're going to be in Acts chapter 15. And I'm going to read starting in verse 15. And to sort of let you know what's going on in Acts chapter 15, it's what it's really a business meeting of church leaders. It's what we call now call the Jerusalem Council. Now, I don't know many, how many of you, I know some of you have ever been to a church meeting. When you have your, your board meetings or your church meetings, uh, really, uh, I'm just saying this with well, all due respect. Most of the time, they're the most boring things you never go to. Before. Only time they get excited is when people start fighting. <laughs> and the bad part is, in church meetings, people like to fight all the time. Sometimes I think the reason we get to have church meetings <clears throat> is so grown adults can act like children in the name of Jesus and religion. Uh, Andy Sam, who gives a lot of credit for this message, a lot of credit for it. I've done, I read his book Deep and Wide. I've studied some of his church. He's got the second largest church in the United States, so he gets a lot of credit for this. He tells a story one time. His dad was a very famous pastor, and his dad was a pastor of a very large church. So Andy Sam, a guy named uh, Louis Giglio, uh, who is now a pastor, all both of them are famous pastors, are at a church meeting when they were kids, and they were. Uh, looking outside the window of this church meeting, when all of a sudden, two of the elders of this big, famous church begin fist fighting in a parking lot. Now here's church people, and they're coming to blows because they can't agree in a church meeting. And sometimes church people act like anything but church people should act like. And then we wonder why people can't, people don't come to church. But the good news is, this has been happening since the church began because the book of Acts is really a story, and I say a story, it's actually an account 
of the church from the very beginning of the church, from day one. And it was written by a man named Luke. And Luke was writing to a friend of his. Some people believe a friend, some people believe a group, some people believe it was to all of us because he writes to this guy named Theophilus. And Theophilus means lover of God. So we do know this. If you're a lover of God, he was writing to you. And, and this is really the second letter Luke wrote, that wrote to Theophilus. The first one was what we call the book of Luke. So again, Luke is very careful to record things exactly as they were told to him by the eyewitnesses. And he records this church meeting in the first century, which actually only takes place about 14 years after Jesus had died on the cross. So the church is brand new. I mean, it's a baby. It's an infant. So I find a lot of comfort in these verses, because I've been in church for a long while now, and I know how sometimes church people act, including myself. Okay, So I put myself in that category myself. But I always tell people, keep your eyes on Jesus, because sometimes, not intentionally, but never do intentionally, sometimes I may say something or do something that's not quite like at all. But if you keep your eyes on Jesus, you'll always see Jesus. So anyway, there's been problems that we read from the beginning of church almost from day one. There's problems in Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 5, Acts chapter 7. But this problem is a little different because this problem is actually the leaders of the church. It's people like Paul that we've been talking about uh, people like Peter, who was one of Jesus' closest friends when he walked here on earth. People like the other apostles who had spent time with him. People like Timothy and Titus. And all these people have gathered together because there is a problem right in the beginning of the church before the church has hardly got off the ground. And the problem in the church is the same problem we have in churches today. And that is, who is this church for? Is this church for insiders or is this church for outsiders? Is this for church for people who know the rules, or is this church for anybody? Is this church for church people, or is this church for unchurched people? So it starts out, while Paul and Barnabas were in Antioch of Syria, some men from Judea came along, or arrived, and began to teach the believers, unless you are circumcised, as required by the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, we read that sometimes, la, la, la. Think about what they're actually saying. They're saying, unless you get circumcised, unless you get this very painful surgical procedure, you can't get saved. You can't join our church. You can't be an insider. You can't even find salvation. Now, I want to let you all know that, especially you men in here, because this is important to men, there are no surgical procedures required to join the Odyssey Church. Okay? <laughs> You don't have to do anything, okay? I just want you to know that. But I think about the, what these men from Judea is saying is, is what they're saying is you cannot have a relationship with God at all unless you go through this ceremony, unless you have this service, unless you become like us and abide by these rules, you can't have a relationship with God. And unless you look like us, act like us, walk like us, you can't even be saved from God's wrath. And we sort of laugh at it and we think about that and we make fun of it today. But how many of us have been in churches where there were rules? And maybe those rules weren't circumcision, but, but circumcision, but we know that there were rules inside that church, right? You have to sing a certain kind of song. If you don't sing a certain kind of song, all other songs are evil. You have to teach from a certain version of the Bible. If you don't teach from that version of the Bible, the word means nothing. And you forget that that's a translation too. Because most of us don't speak Aramaic or Greek or Hebrew. And even if you speak one, you probably don't speak all three. If you don't know when to stand when we do, and you don't know when to kneel when we do, and you don't know when to pray when we do, you're an outsider. In fact, if you do some of those things, not only are we going to make you feel uncomfortable, some of us are even going to question whether you're even saved, whether you have a relationship with God. So here's Jesus. He's only been gone for a couple of years, and the gravitational pull of the church is already towards the inside. It's for those who know the rules. It's for those who know how to obey. It's for those that look like us, act like us. And the only way you can be part of us, the only way you can get close to God, is if you become like us. And, and maybe some of you here have experienced that in the world. I know. 
And this wasn't a small problem because the church comes to the big guns and sends them to the bigger guns. It says Paul and Barnabas disagreed with them, arguing vehemently. Finally, the church decided to send Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem accompanied by some local believers to talk to the apostles and the elders about this question. So they say, okay, Paul and Barnabas, you're the leader of this church, but we're going to send you to the top dogs. We're going to send you to the leaders of all the churches down in Jerusalem. But here's what I love about Scripture. Sometimes we take these great heroes of faith and we put them up on this pedestal and we think that they're perfect. And one of the reasons that I love Scripture It said Paul and Barnabas disagree with them. They were arguing with vehemently. The King James says there was no small dissension and disputation with them. I mean, this was not a calm, I don't think I like what you're saying. This was a heated argument. They were arguing because both sides believed they stood on the side of the truth. The men from Judea, what they were saying is, okay, listen, it's Jesus plus this equals salvation. you got to have one foot on the cross and you got to have one foot on the law, and if you don't do that, you can't be saved. And Paul Barnes says, no, 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 no. It's only by the grace of Jesus. You need Jesus, and you don't need nothing else. If you have Jesus, you have a relationship with God. And I read this, and I thought to myself, no, I really understand what these, you know, sometimes we read it, and we know what the facts are. We know what it is, and we forget. I understand these men of Judea because how many of us in this room haven't thought that we need to earn God's approval? You know, we look at the deepest parts of our heart. We look at some of the things that are going on in our life. Maybe some of the habits we can't quit. And we say, i got to earn God's approval. And i got to earn His love. What is it that I need to do, God, to assure myself of salvation? Paul said, no, 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 you understand. God has unconditional he loves you as you are. He already loves you. You don't have to earn His love. All you have to do is believe in His Son and have a relationship with Him. But I know in my own life, I'll mess up. And, I, and, and, and if that Holy Spirit convicts me, I'm like, Lord, how did I do that? Am I really saved? What do I have to do to earn your love back? See, see the problem with Christianity sometimes is that some people get turned off, but they don't understand because of the simplicity of the Christian faith. God loves us. And all we have to do is love Him back. And we don't have to be perfect. We should strive. Our, 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 our life should go towards the cross. And we know we're going to have these occasions of sin. So we have this gravitational pull towards insiders, at least deep down, because we believe that we have to do something to earn God's love. And, and unconditional love is something that we can't yeah, you know, you, you come home, you get to argue with your wife or your, your spouse or your, your children, and there for a moment you may love them, but you don't like them one bit, do you? So, 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 and we say and we do things. So, and then all of a sudden, you know, we give them the cold shoulder and they have to earn our love back. And that's how we think God is. But God says, I love you unconditionally. So, here's what the church does they send Paul and Barnabas and some of the other people to Jerusalem. And along the way, they stopped at Phoenicia and Samaria to visit some of the believers. And they told it much to their joy that the Gentiles, too, were being converted. Now, and here's this delegation. Here's Paul and Barnabas and these others. And they're traveling along. And what they're going through is a non-Jewish area. They're going through a Greek area. And you may not know this if you're not Jewish or a Gentile. That's what Gentile means, non-Jewish. If you're not, and they're going through this non-Jewish area where there's a couple synagogues set up for the Jewish people, but most of the people are Greek. And Paul and Barnabas had traveled to where they're at. Up in, and, and they traveled up to Antioch, and along the way, they've been inviting people to follow and find Jesus. They've been telling people to become Christians. They've been explaining and planning churches. And, and their method of doing this is they would walk into a Jewish synagogue. That was... Paul's plan of attack. He'd go into a Jewish synagogue where everybody was Jewish, everybody knew the rules, everybody knew the laws, and he would begin to read the scripture. And as he read the scripture, he would begin to see how Jesus fulfilled those scriptures and Jesus was Messiah. So these people in the synagogue, some of them would be converted, become Christians. 
And when they go back along the way, they're just checking to see how things are going out. And when they get there, they find something that's amazing, something they didn't expect. Not only are these Jewish people becoming Christians, but the Jewish people are going out in their communities, into their workplaces. And they're beginning to tell others about this Jesus. And now the non-Jewish people are becoming Christians. They're being converted. Brought them much joy because they didn't expect it. They knew they could get the Jews, but they didn't think they'd get the Gentiles as well. So finally, Paul and Barnabas arrived in uh, Jerusalem, and they were welcomed by the whole church, including the apostles and elders, which was something new because the last time Paul had gone to uh, Jerusalem, he wasn't accepted because he was a, he'd been against the uh, Christian faith for so long. Now they bring back and they welcome their joy, and, and Paul and Barnabas begin to report all the things they had seen and all the things and all the things that they had uh, experienced down the way. So when they get there, they're here and they're going to get this problem worked out. So they, they probably walk in and they say something like this. We, we, we had this problem in the church and you already know about it, but uh, you know, there's just this vision. There's just a vision over people who can come in and those who have to stay out. Who's the church for and who's the church not for and what do people have to do to join? He goes, but let us tell you what we've seen and heard. Let us show you what we've been experiencing. And, and that is, some of the people we've seen coming to God are the very same people that you're telling to stay out. And we're seeing God do miraculous work in their lives. It says, but then some of the believers who belong to the sect of the Pharisees stood up and insisted the Gentile converts must be circumcised and required to follow the law of Moses. And we have to remember that the Pharisees, the sect of the Pharisees, these were the people that planned, perforated, per that comes out on the work. But these are the people that were behind the very crucifixion of Jesus. It was a very legalistic sect. You have to obey the rules to get into heaven. And if you don't, you can't get in. You have to earn your way in. Now, now these particular Pharisees, they are now Christians. Paul used to be a Pharisee. But they're Christians. But so often the reasons that churches are for church people so often is because that's how they were taught. And that's how these Pharisees were taught. They, they were taught that you have to obey the rules plus Jesus equals salvation. Because all their life they've been told that they have to obey these rules. So you just don't forget those things after you've been taught them your whole life. So what they're really thinking is, you know, the church is for church people. It's for those that obey the rules. And if you can't obey the rules, then you can't come to Jesus. You can't have a relationship with and I don't think that these Pharisees, because these Pharisees were now people who believed that Jesus was the Messiah, he was the one that had been prophesied in the scriptures. I don't think they were bad people. They were just doing what they thought they had to do. That they saw salvation as sort of a ladder they had to climb up. You believe in Jesus, and you follow this one, and then you follow this one, and the top of the ladder of salvation, and Paul saying, no, 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 no. It's Jesus. Jesus is not a ladder for salvation. Jesus is, the, the, the law is simply a guard, guard guardrail for living. So the apostles met together to resolve this issue. They had this meeting, the Jerusalem Council, and at the meeting, after a long discussion, Peter stood up and addressed them as follows. He says, brothers, you all know that God chose me from among you some time ago to preach to the Gentiles, to those that are non-Jewish, so that they could hear the good news and believe. So here's Peter, one of Jesus' closest friends on earth. Jesus had told Peter he was going to be the rock upon which he would build his church, and everybody in that meeting knew it. So Peter comes along and he says, okay, you all remember? Remember I was chosen to take this message to the Gentiles? Tell them about Jesus and everybody in the meeting. You know, they're nodding their head, yes. So Peter goes on. He said, God knows people's hearts. And he confirmed that he accepted the Gentiles by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, for he cleansed their hearts through faith. Now, now for the Jewish people that were in that council meeting, this was a huge surprise because the Jewish nation thought the Holy Spirit was reserved for Jewish nation thought that the Holy Spirit was reserved for Jewish people. And Peter is saying, listen, we have seen evidence that God has given His Spirit to people that are not Jewish, that are not Jews. It's a 
man, this was grace. Now, if you're here and you believe or you haven't come to church for a while because you think the church is full of hypocrites, I want you to know you're right, first of all. But it's like the guy told me one time, if, a hip, if God is here and you're here and you let a hypocrite get between you and God, which one of you is supposed to be God? You or the hypocrite? But if, you're, if you don't, if you, if, if you don't like church because it's full of hypocrites, well, this verse should encourage you because the next verse tells you that there have been hypocrites in church is ever since day one. It says, so why are you now, Peter's saying, why are you now challenging God by burdening the Gentile believer with a yoke that neither you nor our ancestors could follow? They weren't able to do this. They weren't able to bear this yoke that we're trying to put on these young believers. Peter says, and I think this should be good news to each one of us. I think it should be good to us. Peter says, and remember, Peter's talking to the church people. He's talking to the end times. He says, you're, look, you're taking this bunch of rules which you can't follow and I can't follow, and then you're putting them on the neck of these young baby Christians. And it's just weighing them down. He says, you hypocrites. You can't even do a good job of keeping these rules. I can't do a good job of keeping these rules. And we've known them since we were born. And if we can't do it, and we're old church people, how do you expect these new church people to do it? He said, we believe that all are saved, Jew and Gentiles, by the same way, by the undeserved grace of Jesus Christ, by the undeserved grace of the Lord Jesus. And that's good news for each one of us. Because Peter is saying, it is God plus not salvation. It is only by the undeserved grace of Jesus Christ that we can be saved. When we believe the message of Jesus, when we believe that He is who He says He is, that this is for everybody, Jew and Gentile alike, church and unchurch alike. And then Paul and Barnabas, they stand up to talk. Now I bet you when Paul and Barnabas got up to talk, that the room sort of got quiet. And Paul and Barnabas begin to tell everything that had happened to them among, and keep in mind that they were traveling among the Gentiles, they were traveling among the unchurch people. Everyone listened quietly as Barnabas and Paul told about the miraculous signs and the wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. And this next one, this next part, is so important. Maybe it's something you know, maybe it's something you don't know. But the next person to get up to speak is not just the leader of the first century church. He's a very, very special person, a man by the name of James. And I imagine... James stands up to speak. He, he doesn't have to say, hey, listen, he does. I don't think he ever said that. I bet you when he stood up to speak, there was a hush that fell over the crowd. Everybody put their listening ears on. This man is special, and we need to hear what he has to say. And he was special not just because he was the leader of the first century church. He was special because he was the brother of Jesus. And James is a man who didn't even believe in Jesus until after Jesus died. He knew Jesus was dead. He saw him buried. He saw him put him in the tomb. And then one day Jesus comes to him and he says, Hey little brother, <laughs> don't get a guy and I come back. Now he, he didn't really say that, so you should read the Bible just so you know. <laughs> but what, this, what the record says is that, that James did come back in his resurrected body to James. And, and I and I, I got crazy mind, so I think things. I'm thinking James is probably thinking, he said, you know, I probably got that wrong. I bet my big brother is who he said he was. It says, when they had finished, James stood up. And he said, brothers, listen to me. Peter has told you about the time God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for himself. And this conversion of the Gentiles is exactly what the prophets predicted. What he's saying is, okay, you, Peter's given you his evidence. He's shown you the works of God. And Paul and Barnabas have shown you and given you their evidence. And they're showing you the works of God. Now, let me show you the Word of God. Because James knew if it did not if it did not go along with Scripture, if it didn't balance with Scripture, then it couldn't be from God. He said, you've seen the works of the Lord, now let's look at the Word of the Lord. As it is written, afterward, I will return and restore the fallen house of David. 
I will rebuild its ruins and restore it so that the rest of humanity might seek the Lord, including the Gentiles, all those I have called to be mine. The Lord has spoken. He who made these things known so long ago. See, so he says, you know, all of this, everything you're seeing right now, everything that Peter's just told you, everything that Paul Martin has done, all this was predicted over 800 years ago by a prophet named Amos. You've been reading about it since your birth in the scriptures. This was predicted. This is it. This is the word of God. And he says, so my judgment is. And when James says, and so my judgment is, what he's saying is, this is the final decision. I've made my mind up, and this is what we're going to abide by. And so my judgment is that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles. He said, we'll not make it difficult for those people who want to turn to God. And this should be the message. Every church, everywhere. It is the vision of the first century church. It is the vision of James, the brother of Jesus. It is the vision of the church today. It is the vision of the Odyssey church. That we should not make it difficult for the people who are turning to God. I do. The leaders that attend here don't want to make it difficult for the people who want to turn to God. For those who want to find and follow Jesus. If we're doing something a stumbling block. Because we want to make it easy. That's another way of saying it. We want to make it easy for people to find and follow Jesus. And we want to do that because we want to lead people into a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. And we're not we're going to compromise the message. I want you to know that. I'm not going to compromise. I don't think you can understand God's love without understanding. We're never going to compromise the message, but we do want to tailor the experience to make it easy to find and follow Jesus. And we do that so we can lead people into a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. No matter whether we're just beginning to see if Jesus is who he says he is, or whether they are we'll see next week, whether they've been walking with him for a long time. Leader of the first century church, brother of Jesus says, we should not make it difficult. This means we should do everything we can. We should do everything in our power to move people from where they are to where God wants them to be. We need to move people closer to God, especially those people who may be far away from God right now. Because God said, I so love the world. The entire world, both the church and the unchurch, that whoever believes in my son, I'm just going to finish up because I have to read these last verses because if you read them on your own and haven't done a lot of study, but I'll be honest with you, the first time I read them, they didn't make sense to me because it really looks like James is making a whole bunch of rules now. He said, okay, you don't need any rules. It's by grace alone, so here's a whole bunch of rules you have to follow. That's not what he's doing. He tells them there's four things that they should do. Verse uh, 20 says, instead we should write down and we should tell them to abstain from eating food that's offered to idols, from sexual immorality, from eating the meat of strangled animals, and from consuming blood. Now, I think, you know, sexual immorality goes without saying. You know, we'll have a, a section of scripture on that at, at some other point next year. But what he's really saying is, is we do need to ask these young believers, these Gentile believers, to do a couple of things. And, and it's not for their self. It's Jesus and nothing but Jesus that leads to salvation. It's a relationship with Jesus that leads to salvation. He goes, but we need to ask them to do a couple things because it's offensive to some people. Let's ask them not to offend anybody by their actions. And verse 21 sort of explains to us why. It says, for these laws of Moses have been preached in the Jewish synagogues in every city, on every Sabbath, for many generations. He said, these rules have been given for hundreds of years. And we don't want to offend anybody. So let's ask them not to do these things, but let's not put a burden, let's not put a yoke on their neck. He said, just simply tell them there's some areas we need to be sensitive to. In the church, we might say something like this in today's world. We might say, you know, as Christians, 
We need to think about the three lines above Paul. Paul, Paul, the Apostle Paul, wrote these words. He, said, he might say something like this. You need to be careful so that your freedom does not cause others with a weaker conscience to stumble. They said, you know, you can do some things as a, as a Christian. You may be saved and you can do some things, but you'll call somebody who's not as strong as you to fall from the faith, and you don't want to do that. So let's just, let's just not offend them, okay? And these are the things that will offend the people the most. You don't do them because you're not saved. You do them because you don't want to be a stumbling block to somebody else. And, and I have to tell you, just in the, in the last 10 months of research, this is so clear. And the hard part I have to come is what's clear in my mind is trying to relate it to both. This is so clear to me because I see time and time and time again the gravitational pull of every church that comes to the inside. And if the honesty church is not intentional, if we're not careful about making it easy to find and follow Jesus, for those who are especially far away from it, without realizing one day we get up our eyes and see we're catering to the needs of the few, and we're missing the people who need Jesus most. And we do this because our desire as a church body is to lead people into a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. Because we know God so loved the Lord that He gave His one and only Son so that everyone, the insiders and the outsiders, the unchurched and the church, those who believe in him will not perish have everlasting life. So here's my challenge. If you're a church person, if you're a church person, then we're asking you to you know, come out of your comfort zone a little bit. We need you. Become a volunteer. Fill out one of those yellow sheets in your bulletins and leave it in the book by the door. And if you're a new believer, if you're somebody just beginning to realize that Jesus Christ is exactly who he says he is, we're going to have a baptism service. We want you to get baptized. You've never been baptized? We want you to get baptized November the 2nd, two weeks from the day. And so that you're not uncomfortable, I'll let you know we've already got a couple people lined up. We've got a baptismal that's coming in here. And it would be my great pleasure to help you put your board. Uh, but we want you to do that because really what baptism is, it's an outward ceremony of inward belief. And if you're still not sure if Jesus is who he says, you're not sure that the Odyssey Church is for you, we just ask you to come back uh, next week as we begin to tell you the, the how, how we plan to do this, why we need to do it, and what we need to do, the how behind the why of uh, why we need the Odyssey Church. I'm going to ask Jimmy and Diane if they will to come up there and play. And I want you to let you know I'm going to stand up here for a couple seconds. If you need special prayer, if you need to be introduced to Jesus and make him Lord of your life, I'm going to be up here so you can know how to take God upon his offer of salvation through the undeserved grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's not make it difficult for people who want to turn to God. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. God bless you all. Thank you so much. I'm up here if you need me.